Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey, Food Junkies listeners, Clarissa here. And today I'm interviewing neuroscientist, researcher, speaker, consultant, and author, Dr. Amy Reichelt. I always think it's fun to get a little backstory, so I'll let you in on what happened before the show. We're all prepared to go, and Molly unfortunately had something she had to attend to, so I had to go it alone for this one. I immediately felt nervous because I had read so many of her research articles, and I knew she was brilliant. Yes, imposter syndrome shows up for us as well when we interview our guests. Of course, my fears were completely irrational, and Amy and I hit it off. We chatted for a good half an hour before we recorded. Not only that, I found out that she's currently living in Toronto. And so I asked her if she'd be willing to be a speaker at our Sweet Sobriety Conference in October. And she said yes. So she will be one of our sensational Saturday speakers. And her topic is the neuroscience of sugar and food addiction. Dr. Amy Reichelt has a PhD in neuroscience, a Bachelor of Science with honors in psychology, and an advanced diploma in nutrition. She is a pharmaceutical professional leading clinical development in psychedelic drugs. She is passionate about uncovering how lifestyle, diet, and novel pharmacotherapies can enhance brain health and mental well being. And she places health and mental wellness at the core of her personal and professional identity. I was actually sharing with her in that pre interview talk how my friends call me the sugar sheriff. And she said her friends and family affectionately refer to her as the health witch. I loved it. She has a private nutrition practice, Cognition Nutrition, where she connects people with the knowledge and tools to change their behaviors around health and wellness. She is a recognized leader in the field of neuroscience, health, and medicine, and she has authored over 50 peer-reviewed scientific articles in eminent journals, including The Lancet, Child and Adolescent Health, Nature Communications, Journal of Neuroscience, and Trends in Neuroscience, hence why I was so nervous. From her research, she has developed scientific expertise in cognition, brain development, the gut microbiome, behavior control, and neurodegenerative disease, and has received competitive awards in scientific leadership, communication, and over $3.6 million in government funding. Like I said, and from what you will hear in this interview, beyond her academic credentials, she is so approachable and down to earth. She loves food. She actually posts these things called dopamine dinners on her Instagram page, which you should definitely check out. She loves running, painting, yoga, and hiking in the great Canadian outdoors with her partner, Ben, and their dogs, Frank and Otto. Now enjoy the show. Warning, you might have to listen a few times to catch all her incredible answers. All right, we're so excited today to have Dr. Reichelt on the Food Junkies podcast. So welcome so much. Thank you for being here. No worries. Really good to speak with you. Yes, I'm so excited about this interview because, you know, I read some of your publications. I listened to a podcast you were on and I was like, you talk about things about food and sugar specifically and how it affects the brain. And we don't always address these things. So we're going to get these to some of these topics today. I'm wondering first, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, who you are, what was your personal professional journey to get here? Okay. So I'm Amy Reichelt. I have a PhD in neuroscience and a bachelor's in psychology. I did my undergrad at University of Birmingham in the UK, and then I did my PhD in neuroscience at Cardiff University in the UK. And my initial training was really around the cognitive effects of neurodegeneration. So I spent my PhD 
basically giving mice and rats a lot of drugs and being kind of interested in how this mapped onto dementia development and trying to you know, stimulate cognition in these animals. I then did a short stint as part of my PhD working at Eli Lilly in Big Pharma in the neurodegenerative drug hunting team that was based in Surrey in the UK. And there I learned more about how drugs are tested and how dementia can, and neurodegeneration, the molecular mechanisms there and how that can be addressed by pharmaceuticals. At that point, I was, you know, kind of toying up whether to go into pharma or to stay in academia. And I chose to stay in academia because I was so enthralled with the idea of having my own lab group and being able to really study what I wanted to study. And I did a postdoc where I studied the molecular mechanisms of memory in particular memory updating and how it mapped on to addiction and PTSD. And at this stage, I was working in a laboratory, again, back at the University of Birmingham. I didn't travel that far at this stage in my life, with a researcher called uh, Professor Jonathan Lee. And we were looking at how sugar memories could be updated. So he'd done loads of work previously around fear and around cocaine and he found a way that you know, through disrupting this process called memory reconsolidation, which basically strengthens memories. If you disrupt it, you lose that strength of memory. So it could be applied to these conditions mapped on to, to human, say, substance use disorder or to PTSD as these maladaptive behavior driven through memory. And I was working on this sugar and these rats just would not stop responding for sugar. <laughs> and I was like, there's something going on here because this isn't the strongest memory. We haven't trained them that much. But for rats, this these little sugar pellets were just so rewarding. And there was something else to it. And I was like, it's because it's a survival mechanism because the sugar is so important to them. It's both nutrients and it's also a reward. So... That really inspired me to go on and start to look more about how food was affecting the brain. So building these really strong pathways that drive behavior. And then I moved across the world to UNSW in Sydney. And I was really fortunate while I was working in Australia that I was funded by the Australian Research Council to be able to start my own lab and research what I was interested in, which was how food was affecting decision-making behavior and frontal processes and memories and really how our behaviors are controlled, not just by food and by the environment that we're in. Like our food choices are driven by the environment, but then our environment and what we consume influences our choices themselves. So it's like a chicken and egg problem. And I went on from there to, to have my own lab and research funding groups in Sydney and then in Melbourne, and then moved to Western University in Canada, where I continue to research the effects on a specific subtype of neurons called palvalbumin neurons, which are inhibitory GABAergic neurons. These are like the little breaks in the brain and I was really intrigued about how our diet affects these very sensitive neurons that are slow to mature, particularly in the frontal cortex, surrounded by really interesting other neural circuits, really integral parts of, of how our brain functions together. And also in really key areas involved in decision-making and behavioral control. So the frontal cortex, but then also the hippocampus. And now I work in, in pharma. So took a bit of a 360 there, and I actually work in psychedelic drug development now, focusing around both psychiatric disorders, but also key research around neurological disorders. So I've been you know, around researching a lot and and I've done a lot of interesting work that's been really fundamental for both 
other people's research groups, but also how I am inspired by other people's research in both the substance use disorder world, in the memory world, and also the neurogeneration world. So putting it all together to, to really understand that. I'm also a trained nutritionist and nutritional counsellor, and I'm generally just really interested in how food affects the brain. <laughs> Oh, I love it so much. You do have a very elaborate research career. I'm wondering, you know, before we jump in, you spoke specifically about doing research on rats. And I know sometimes we get some pushback um, in the, you know, field saying, is this, you know, this research isn't done on humans. And can you tell us why researchers tend to use rats most commonly? It's because we can control so many more elements around the environment that the animals are in. I'm, I'm not going to say the rat brain is the same as the human brain, but what's important is they have the same neurotransmitters as us and they have the same drive towards food as us in a way. They may not have the same sophisticated repertoire of behaviors and particularly around things like body image and those very high order psychological constructs that can only come with having a much more developed brain as a human does. We have, you know, much more communication. I don't see rats being really, you know, influenced by, by you know, peer pressure. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, that rat's got a cake. I'm really jealous. Actually, they do get jealous, I think, of, you know, if, if they, they see other rats eating, I think that they do. Yeah. It's more that we can look at the molecular substrates much more easily. We can study how the brain is changed at that molecular level. Human brain scans are fascinating and there's so many new techniques particularly around functional imaging that allows us to understand how neurotransmitters are working, say for in, in PET scans. However, people have to then have a radioactive ligand injected into them. It's not the most appealing for many people. The same with an fMRI, you've got to lie there really still and the machine's really loud. It's not like a really natural environment. Also, you can't have anything metal in there. So, you know, if you're doing a feeding experiment in an fMRI, Dana Small has done some amazing work at Yale and you've seen her set up. It's like 3D printed bits of plastic, everything, and people just like sucking on a milkshake. And it's limited there. And also the issue is that with people, just because we're so much more complex than rats, it's difficult to control what people are eating. Like, And also people lie all the time about what they're eating. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we've heard, right? The self-reporting is just not very truthful. And it may just also be because they don't even recognize other things that they are eating outside of it or behaviors. Absolutely. So thank you so much for that clarification. I'm wondering, because we always focus on the dopamine reward system, your research really focuses how diet changes the brain. Can you share with us what you found in your research about how soon this can happen in a person when they start eating a Western diet high in sugar and fat and how it actually affects our prefrontal cortex and higher cognition? Yeah, so there's research that we conducted in my lab and also with Margaret Morris's lab at UNSW as well. And it was particularly found that initially the diets, when we put rats on this Western diet, which was literally a Western diet, you know, they were eating pie and cake and, you know, cookies, all the good stuff effectively that's bad for your brain. And within the space of five days, these rats started to show deficits in a memory task, which I mean, it's quite a complex memory task. This it's, it's a very subtle task. And that was really pretty profound because this was such a rapid deterioration of cognition. And when we then extrapolate that to humans, there was work by Richard Stevenson's lab conducted at Macquarie. And this work showed that, again, with a student cohort where they controlled their breakfasts to, you know, this like, I think it's like a hypercaloric, hyper high calorie, high sugar, high fat milkshake situation they were eating. And that also had an impact on memory performance in healthy students within the space of four to five days. So 
this is pretty rapid. And I started wandering around trying to build in the sort of more naturalistic effect of, you know, we don't as humans just consume sugar all day. We will sort of binge on it almost, like particularly liquid sugar that we don't realize has all of the sugar in. In fact, my students were always horrified when I was like, we're going to make a 10% sucrose solution up. And they'd be like, ooh, we're going to make some sucrose. It sounds very technical. Literally, we're just getting the like white sugar out of the, like from the supermarket and just like pouring it in. And you see the amount of what 100 grams of sugar. So a 10% sugar solution is 100 grams of sugar in a liter of water effectively. And you see that and they're like, that's a lot of sugar. And I'm like, yeah, this is like your Coca-Cola that you're drinking, you know, and some of them, like, if you're looking at some drinks have even more than that, if they're looking at like 12% sugar and we were giving this to rats and we did it in a controlled time as well. So they only got two hours access where they could like just drink as much as they could of their sugary solution in the same way that people will potentially, you know, just drink a load of Coca-Cola at lunchtime or when they're you know out for a drink or just having this like rapid consumption. And we found that in the space of two weeks, we started seeing the same hippocampal deficits in these animals. We didn't test in that five day period. We thought we'll bring it out to 14 days, then to 28 days. And also when we then started running frontal tasks with them, we saw at 28 days, deficits starting to arise in terms of decision-making, impulsivity, and behavioral control. So it's pretty rapid what's happening. I was also really intrigued about how our hippocampus is capable of making new neurons. It's a process called neurogenesis, but the new neuron process takes about 28 days. So I was like, well, let's, if we're gonna, you know, hit the the sweet spot effectively of when we can start looking at how the architecture of neurons in the brain are starting to be changed. Let's do 28 days, so really a month of you know this this consumption type behavior. And this went in hand with the deficits that we were seeing in terms of behavioral control. So it's not long. And I think that with people as well, you start to see, you know over potentially like Thanksgiving or festive periods where you, you know, start to really let rip and you're like, ah, it's just, it's Christmas. Why not? But this kind of thing is, you start feeling rough, like your brain doesn't work. And then you start craving it as well. And then this behavior becomes, you can really fall off the wagon if you are being careful about what you're eating and it can start to really predispose this habit forming. And other researchers as well, Laura Corbett, who's a U of T now, and she was previously at Sydney, she showed that with like a milkshake situation solution they made with condensed milk, which is like fatty and sugary, that again, habit forming was changed within, I think, 14 to 28 days of consumption of these foods. And that had a an impact on areas of the striatum in the brain, which feeds into the prefrontal cortex. So there's so much these diets can affect in such a rapid way. Yeah. And it really speaks to, you know, when we just allow ourselves, like, even if you think about the cheat days that people have sometimes, you know, they'll eat, you know, really clean for however many days, especially in the fitness world and how, you know, that can still be affecting you just that one day, you know, that many days later. And I think it also really speaks to what we see working clinically with individuals when they come off, you know, sugar and they speak about coming out of that brain fog and starting to get clear again, but that it does take some time. It's not just, you know, they'll go through that detox, maybe withdrawal. And then it's like you said, probably about two weeks to three weeks before they really start to get that clarity back again. I'm wondering, you also said that you found in your research that when the rats were allowed to binge on the sugar, that they actually started restricting their regular rat chow. And do you think that this actually could explain more of the cognitive decline and impairment we see in the general population? Because now they're not only eating foods that increase neuroinflammation, 
but they're eliminating foods that could serve that protective mechanism for them as well. Yeah, what was really interesting is that it was so rats have this fascinating ability that they can titrate out their caloric intake according to their demands to maintain their weight. So although sucrose solution has got calories in, it's it's not as calorie dense as say, you know, a high fat drink or a high fat. We saw that when we looked at the calories consumed overall, they were basically equal or maybe a little bit higher in the sucrose consuming animals. So it was fascinating. And this was interesting because they maintained their weight as well. But when we looked at them at the dissection stage, when we did basically a little autopsy on the rats, when we we took their brains out to be able to look into how the neurotransmitters were changed, how the cells were changed after they had all their behavioral testing. We also looked at their adipose tissue, so the white fat that is deposited, and we found greater deposits of the white fat. And we also saw changes in the liver as well. So they started getting triglyceride deposits. This was more pronounced when they had, say, a a high fat, high sugar, basically like cookie dough to consume. So we did some work on that as well. But definitely with the sugar, there was this amazing titration of their energy input and to to maintain that. And that does suggest as well, they were able to sense the nutrients going in, in terms of the energy from the sugar. And you also saw them that because we gave them the sugar at the same time every day, they almost got to this like little ritual and they'd be so excited when you'd come at them and they would know that they were getting the sugar because we would take the water bottles off and start like moving things around and you'd see them and they would all sort of like stand up in the cage and be like, yeah, sugar o'clock. And this is like, you know, this anticipatory behavior is exactly the same as I see my dogs. Like they get fed at 5 p.m. every day. And from like 3 p.m. onwards, they're like hustling me for, for food. But it's the same with all animals. They adapt to the environment. And if they know that there's this sort of environmental cue that's like we wheel in the big trolley with the things of, you know, new water, we take off the water, we put on the sugar things and we're weighing them. And, you know, so we can work out what they're going to consume and how much they're consuming in that time period. Yeah. They really tune into it and they know what's happening. And other researchers have shown this as well, that you know they do have this anticipatory behavior. So these kind of food rewards are so pronounced to these animals. It's such an important cue to them. Yeah, and we certainly see that in addiction as well. And we call that like jonesing, right? As people definitely start to get like a physiological response if they're driving to the liquor store or they're going to their drug dealer's house, like that all of those behaviors start to you know, their heart rate increases, they're, they're just, it's, I feel like that's where the dopamine's already starting to fire for a a lot of people and driving that like motivation to keep going and get that reward slash relief. Yeah. Um, And I think it's really interesting as well, because when we think about dopamine, it's not just a reward signal. It's a learning signal. Our brain learns because it's something physiologically relevant to it. And dopamine's also so important for movement. When we see people with with Parkinson's disease, that's because of the decline of the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. And that's what's causing the reduction in movement. But you know, so you see this like surge of behavior because the dopamine system has become in tuned and they've learned, you know, this is the time it's, you know, 10 a.m., going to get my two hours of access to my lovely sugary water and, you know, this surge of energy. And they've learned all about, you know, the cues that precipitate this you know, coming of the good stuff. It's just amazing. And then, yeah, it can be so mapped on to the human condition and how we act in the world as well. Yeah, no, I think that is so true. And just when you were talking about, I was just thinking about like, even how people get excited about, like you said, Christmas, 
dinner or Thanksgiving dinner and like, you know, the anticipation we feel towards it and all the favorite, you know, greets that are going to be served and how that can as well elicit that dopamine response, which is just like, you know, so when you have to change it for a lot of people, when in food addiction recovery, you know, they may have to learn new ways and find new things for themselves in order to still enjoy those holidays and see that, you know, that was potentially not, you know, probably the most loving way that they could spend those meals. And now they have to do it differently. And, but it's so funny when you're sitting at the table, watching everyone else still, you know, take part in that cycle or tradition. I'm wondering if you can speak to the behavioral aspect of what you found in your research in relation to like learning how these foods also affect self-control and the inhibitory neurons, habit acquisition and learning. Yeah. So some of the key experiments that we ran were really around how our environment controls our behavior. And we looked at how we use the task that we adapted from a human task called the Stroop task, where you have to, basically you have a word like red written in red ink, and that's a, a congruous compound because you've got red, the meaning and the color is red. And then you have red written in blue ink, and that's incongruous because it's the word is red, so you read it, the meaning is red, but the color is blue. And then you get a conflict there in the Stroop task, and when you're told basically you you have to name the color of the ink the word is written in, so because your brain's just like, I want to read the word, not name the color. And so this is basically using cues and rules that you have to follow. And we adapted this task for rats. They can't see in color so or, or read. So it's a bit complex for them. But we set up this task which involved basically these compound cues of like uh, sounds and or visual cues. And they had to follow this task and this dictated which lever they had to press to get a reward. And when we fed the rats the sucrose solution, we found that they were less able to perform the complex task where they had to follow the cue and there was the conflict came up. So they were less able to follow a rule effectively and they just went for it and pressed whatever. And this task is very in tuned to the function of the prefrontal cortex And this is so important for decision-making and behavioral control. And this task is also shown to be disrupted in individuals who have frontal cortex damage or in people, say, with traumatic brain injuries can cause this kind of deficit, Um, individuals with any kind of frontal damage. And it was really interesting because then I wanted to look at the subpopulations of types of neurons that are really critical for cognition as well. And the types of neurons that I was interested in were called parvobumin expressing neurons. So these are GABAergic neurons. GABA is the principal inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And these neurons basically fire onto excitatory neurons, which are our glutamate neurons that go And these are the little breaks that stop the go. And so our brain doesn't, you know, doesn't can't do anything simply. It just has to, you know, have an interim just to make things a bit more complicated. And these little neurons as well are very abundant in areas of the cortex, like our prefrontal cortex, and also in our hippocampus. And the little breaks that can, you know, stop a behavior effectively. And they're very fast spiking. So that that means that they are very energetically demanding. So when they do fire, they fire really hard. They're like, pow, 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 pow. Stop this behavior. And because of this high energy demand, it means that they're quite susceptible to the environment that they're in. And we found that when these rats were consuming a lot of sugar, they would have increased amounts of inflammation in their brain as well as their body because of the sugar. 
quite how the neuroinflammation is set up in the brain is another question that I didn't really answer with my work, but I've been following other people's work and it's being more and more understood around how you know the blood brain barrier becomes leaky when you have increased cytokines and these neurons are basically starting to get damaged by the environment that they're in. And because they are highly energetic, this means that they are more susceptible to detriment from the environment. And this is really fascinating because we've got like these key neurons that are critical for cognition and controlling all these other neurons. They're like little orchestrators of behavior effectively. And these are the ones that are getting damaged by the high sugar diets. And, you know, it was really fascinating seeing that they were effectively stripped in areas of the brain and whether or not it's the neuron is dead, we don't know, or it just stops expressing the pulvalbumin, which is a key protein. That was another thought that we were sort of musing around because you know we don't want to just say, oh, these cells are dead. It may be that they just don't function in the same way and that they don't have this protein expressed as fully anymore. But it was really interesting to see how this has this profound change on behavior and precisely these circuits that are starting to be affected that can drive behavior. And this is similar to people who are trying to you know, potentially change their behavior, change how they're eating. When you've become very attuned to your environment and how you, what you eat, when you eat, these kind of habits are difficult to break. And you need that enhanced behavioral control, this like, you know, precise decision making behavior to be able to resist these temptations. You know, if every time you go and fill your car up with gas, you go and pay and because it's expensive, you're like, oh, I'll buy a chocolate bar. Or every time it's, you know, lunch break at work, you go and buy your sandwich and, and a Coke or you know you pick something up it's these behaviors that are very ingrained and you have to have that conscious decision making to override that predisposition of behavior and yet these foods themselves are the ones that undermine that ability so it's like trying to rebuild from the ground up effectively and also that for so many people, you've been consuming these foods for so long that potentially they have had an effect on your brain your entire life. So you're not even starting at the point where your brain has like an underlying, you know, ground zero, which is which is good. It could be that you're already at a detrimental effect of these foods because you've been consuming them for so long. And that's really scary. But at the same time, it's the knowledge of this is important and that we can utilize our frontal lobes and have different strategies to overcome these things. And importantly, it's that awareness that we need when we have this goal-directed behavior as opposed to a habit. We need to boost this goal-directed behavior that requires the cognitive control to then overcome this predisposed habit and then our goal directed behavior starts to become habitual. No, and I think that what you just said was so important is that, you know, basically I think it highlights how important it is for us to stop as soon as possible because every single additional thing we eat that has sugar in it is just causing more damage, even though to the brain than we actually potentially may have thought in the past. Like we know, you know, oh, it's not the best choice for me body wise. But that, you know, every single time if I have a slip or a return to use, that I am just, again, reinforcing that same habitual cycle and reducing my impulse control or my ability to access my wise mind when it comes to some of these distractions and temptations that are all over our society all of the time. I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to how you know, these foods also, you mentioned the blood brain barrier and how it affects like the hippocampus specifically and the hypothalamus. Also, I heard you in that interview 
mentioning a perineuronal net, which I didn't even know what that was. And I think, you know, our listeners would really appreciate hearing about it. What is it? Why is it important? And how is it affected by our diet? Yeah. So stop with the hippocampus. Hippocampus is the memory center of the brain. And it is the area of the brain that starts to deteriorate in dementia. So it's key for encoding memories. And it is a little structure in the brain, in the temporal lobe, and it's located very closely to the blood-brain barrier, as is the hypothalamus as well. Hypothalamus is you know, important for nutrient sensing as well as you know, hunger, satiety. And these areas of the brain, because they're located so close to the blood-brain barrier, that they have, unfortunately, they get the effects of neuroinflammation very quickly. And they're also very small areas of the brain. And the hippocampus is actually encapsulated. So it's almost like it's a little separate bit of the brain. And this means that you can start getting the inflammation set up and the effects are quite profound. And that's why it's thought the effects of the diets have such a a rapid effect on the hippocampus. And in terms of the perineuronal nets, so they're super cool. And I would advise anyone who, you know, just has any sort of appreciation of, you know, knowing what a neuron enwrapped with a perineuronal net looks like, just Google it and just be like image search because they're really cool. And they were kind of ignored for a long time. So they were discovered like, you know, when microscopy was invented and you bit. But they were just thought to be like an artifact. And they are a form of extracellular matrix that is in all of our tissues that surrounds our our cells effectively. And as a student, you do start to think like, oh, the neurons look like this and the brain looks like this. And you kind of ignore that there's like other things going on. You're like, it's all about synapses and it's all about how the neurons like connect together via synapses. But actually the brain is so complex that it's got this external milieu of you know goo around but it's a lot more complex than that as well so it's not just like you know <laughs> it's just just this amorphous structure that this is you know it's made up of proteoglycans and other molecules that adhere to the surface of the cell and perineuronal nets are particularly found around our pulvalbumin neurons and they form like this mesh-like lattice around the neuron, encapsulating it. And they serve the purpose of both controlling plasticity by basically dictating where the neuron can form its synapses and who synapses with it, and also forms this lovely little protective shield around the neuron and makes it basically this little microenvironment. So in the case of a neuron that's been exposed to free radicals or cytokines or like other damaging chemicals, this microenvironment can protect the neuron to an extent from basically being disrupted in terms of its function. And we found that the perineuronal, which I was obsessed with because they look so pretty and I will just go and sit in a darkened room with a microscope, just being like, this one's a good one, look at it this one's really pretty. And we would look at them and what we saw is that these are slow to develop in the frontal cortex. So there's a developmental trajectory of these perineuronal nets because they effectively lock in this plasticity. So they, they, they make it so, you know, these, these circuits becoming more hardwired. So when we think about the prefrontal cortex, it's the last area of the brain to develop. And thus, it would be natural that it is more plastic throughout our early life. And then as circuits become more and more embedded into our behaviors, that these nets do sort of form and lock in that plasticity and you know prevent further changes in the prefrontal cortex at least but also that they are protecting these neurons however we've got another subset of cells in the brain who are also really pretty they're called microglia and i think of them as being the little 
I say they're the roadies of the brain. They are there to clean up the mess, but sometimes they get a bit carried away. So when you've got a situation of potentially neurodegeneration or you've got some sort of insult that's happened to the brain, some injury, or you've got a lot of inflammatory cytokines going around, these become activated. They're like, yeah, I'm going to clean up. And they're tidying up, but then sometimes they just get a little too excited and they can start firstly stripping the synapses from the neurons. So they're like, ooh, a synapse they're not going to need that. It's like when I'm on a real cleaning purge and I'm like, oh no, I threw out something really important. But also they start going for the perineuronal nets or at least that there is damage to the perineuronal nets and they're tidying that up too. So there's this real like balance in the brain that there are things that are important for maintenance of the brain and these processes that are needed to, you know, make sure that, you know, if it's a synapse that's not getting used, let's just chuck that out, or, you know, this is damaged, let's tidy that up. And that then these processes can become maladaptive and like hyper, you know, too much, you know, there, there's too much damage taking place. And these then have this vicious circle of then damage, further damage happening as an effect of the stimulation and the microglia become hyperactivated, always primed, ready to go and overreact to the simplest, tiniest insult. And also this is going to cause more and more damage as it goes on. And perineuronal nets may only leave the damaged neurons. So the neurons getting damaged, these are the ones that are highly plastic because they've got more less condensed perineuronal nets around them um, and the, the neurons that survive in these environments are the ones with the condensed perineuronal nets around them which then means that they're less plastic so it's more difficult for the brain to adapt and rewire so I was really getting into this side of how we could then start to control how the brain is effectively wiring itself in these kind of food, poor diet induced damaging events. No, I find that so fascinating. And I did uh, Google just to see what they look like and they are beautiful and fascinating, just exactly like you said. Now I'm wondering, you also specifically speak to the adolescent brain and how it's very malleable because of, you know, the increased levels of neuroplasticity at that time. And so if we know the brain is highly receptive to being shaped and rewired by, you know, this Western diet that most youth are eating and that, you know, some of these foods could make this become hardwired while the brain is continuing to do that development. What I found so interesting was how you mentioned that, you know, often at that age, youth are experiencing like, like a growth spurt. And so although we're not seeing it on the outside, that there is so much going on potentially on the inside and the brain is still being impaired. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I think of adolescence as being like the perfect storm for setting up a number of maladaptive behaviors in later life, unfortunately. I think that the issues really lie in the fact that yeah, you've got a still not fully formed prefrontal cortex, yet the free reign to consume whatever you want, and also a heightened reward drive because your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed, yet your reward system is. And then you also have this high metabolism. So, you know, going through growth spurts, I mean, people often speak about their, their teenage boys and how they just won't stop eating because, and they're very expensive just to control these kids' diets because you're so hungry all the time. Because, you know, even if you are exercising, just growing the amount of energy that it takes your body to potentially growing several inches over the course of, of a year, you know, you're really building muscle, you're, you're building height and all these things together are protecting your body from the excessive caloric consumption because your body's using these calories because it needs this energy. However, the issue is that your brain 
is still sensitive to these diets and what you're eating and your reward system is being stimulated. And we know that the more you stimulate any brain circuit, the more strengthened it becomes. So in a way, you're setting in process this eating behaviors become hardwired. You've got potential for you know the changing and shaping of your reward system because you've starting to develop, you know, effectively a sweet tooth and you don't have the negative consequences of putting on weight for many individuals. And some individuals at an early, at a young age do put on weight. And, you know, there is people say about how when they go to university or college that they're like, oh, you know, their, their eating behaviors, they're still the same because they've, you know, built up, this is their like lifestyle habit of how they eat. And then because they have, you know, stopped their growth spurt, they're still eating in that way and they start to gain weight. And that can be very shocking for people because they're like, oh, I've just put on like the freshman 15. It's like, well, it's probably because you're just drinking loads of Coke and eating crap. And yeah, this, th- these behaviors are then difficult to break because, this has been how you you've grown up effectively eating and you've developed this taste for sweet things and your prefrontal cortex may have in a way adapted to this as being you know these are the behaviors that I'm hardwired to perform all the more reason for a much earlier intervention on some of the choices, you know, that we are feeding our kids or, you know, making our teenagers a little bit more informed about how eating these foods can be very damaging to their brain. I know now that you're working in the field of psychedelics and, you know, we know that they can enhance the stimulation of new connections in the prefrontal cortex and act as anti-inflammatory agents as well. So if they can help rewire the brain and boost neurocircuitry, do you believe they could help with addiction and obesity? Yeah, I genuinely do. And um, there's been so much success so far in terms of clinical research trials looking at, you know, the use of say psilocybin for the treatment of substance use disorders and nicotine in particular. There's been some really interesting research out of Johns Hopkins, but also alcohol use disorder as well. So there's definitely these maladaptive neural circuits that have become very ingrained into the brain and behaviors of individuals who have developed addiction-like behaviors or addictive behaviors. And I think that with food as well, any kind of underlying habit that's become really entrained into our brain, an increase in plasticity through the use of psychedelics with psychotherapy to complement the behavior uh, change that's needed because you can't just increase plasticity and then just let someone loose because they'll just continue their old behaviors and then it'll be back even stronger. It's, you know, it's important to think about these drugs as being a way of, you know, supercharging therapy. You still got to do the work, unfortunately. They're not that shortcut. They might get you there faster, but it's not, you know, just the cure-all that, you know, you just go do your mushroom ceremony or your ayahuasca ceremony, and then you're a changed person and everything's fine. You've got to still, you know, do the work, working with your therapist and your counselor and, and you know, understanding how you're going to you know, put this plan into action, because otherwise things aren't going to change. But yeah, there's been a clinical trial at least registered that is looking at psilocybin for binge eating disorder. And we understand that, you know, these kind of behavioral triggers are really important for basically maintaining the the binge eating behavior and that stress is a real driver of these kind of behaviors. People with these kind of eating behavioral disorders and we think about food addiction as mapping on quite closely to substance use disorder, that it's important. I think this is considered as potentially a therapy for individuals. And I would love for research and clinical trials to really move forward with this because I think that it will help people. And as well, 
there is the potential that, you know, help with people's body images. If people have obesity and, you know, they have, you know, poor negative body image and they're afraid to go to the gym or start exercising, they're, they're very, psychedelics can really help with insights around body image and help to address the stresses that can and founded stresses sometimes that prevent people from having these behavioral changes that are important for their lifestyle. So for, you know, going to the gym, adopting new eating habits, these kind of shifts are so important and can really help an individual along their wellness journey, getting over those initial roadblocks that people perceive and maybe showing them that they're not in the same way, you know, roadblocks, that these are things that are quite simple to overcome and, you know, hamper these lifestyle changes. And also that so many people who have, say, food addiction, obesity, also have binge eating disorder, are quite commonly also experiencing mental health issues like depression and anxiety. And it's been shown that psychedelics are so effective for assisting with major depressive disorder. So there's compass pathways will have entered into phase three of their clinical trials. And hopefully that means in 2024, at, you know, if they have positive data, this will support the FDA approval of psilocybin assisted psychotherapy for depression. And that this then means that moving on from there, there are other indications that can start to be addressed and helping people with anxiety and in general, helping people to live better lifestyles. It's just so wonderful to hear this type of hope, specifically as a clinician who works with individuals with major depressive disorder and anxiety who've tried all the medications and have used all of the tools that, and they're just not finding that release or, or that relief or recovery that they've been seeking and still being so, you know, entrenched in that life that they feel like they lose that hope. And so I think that this is a beautiful thing that, you know, the psychedelics could offer them. Absolutely. I'm wondering if you would be willing to speak to your thoughts on the new GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic and Wigaby. Yeah, so I've been following with interest what is happening with these drugs. They are unfortunately, I think, being very much overhyped at the moment. I mean, for years, there's been no effective pharmacological treatment for obesity. And the effective pharmacological treatments have been pretty brutal when we think about the ones that, you know, prevent you from absorbing fat. And the downstream effects of that physiologically are pretty horrible, but also we need fat for our brains. And we also know that fat isn't the enemy here a lot with food. Fat is very sating and, you know, nutrient dense in terms of energy and the sugar that's affecting the brain. But these GLP-1 agonists are like they're semaglutide and they work on our satiety signaling hormones in the body. And they basically help our pancreas make more insulin. And by mimicking this GLP-1 hormone, they lower blood glucose levels as well after you've eaten a, a meal and making you basically feel sated and fuller for longer. So the reports are that individuals taking these drugs just don't feel like eating anymore because they just always feel sated, which is kind of horrible in a way. But by changing your appetite control, this then, you know, people are rapidly experiencing weight loss because they're effectively starving themselves because they don't feel hungry. And then you're losing weight but are you losing weight at the extent of just not eating healthily? Because you could just be eating whatever. You could be eating like some sort of you know, chocolate bar, but you know, that, which is no empty calories again, really. Like your body can use them for whatever fuel is needed, but it's not good for your brain just to be eating a load of sugar. And also, you know, so you're dropping weight, but you're not building the healthy habits that are needed for sustained weight loss. 
you can't take these drugs forever because you know there's there's studies that are still being conducted along you know really the the long lasting effects of these drugs you can get rebound increases in weight as soon as you're coming off these drugs again because you haven't addressed the underlying root cause of you know your eating behavior like what you're eating so it could be that you know you've eaten junk food your entire life you have got to the stage where you have such adiposity that you are now eligible to go on to these drugs your doctor is like yeah you you have obesity i'm gonna prescribe you this you know you've got some metabolic disorder stage you go on to this drug you drop your weight but you still haven't built the healthy habits that are needed there's no acknowledgement of what these drugs are doing in terms of your brain and how you know that's really the key part of what is driving the maladaptive eating behaviors that are underpinning obesity i mean in a way they may be a catalyst for individuals it's difficult to evoke a behavioral change initially and not see any changes so if you've gone to the extent of you know cutting out sugar from your diet and you know these things that previously brought you joy and or at least you know satiation are now taken away but nothing happens in terms of your body weight and you're told that it's your body weight that is is detrimental to your health because this isn't happening change wise yeah like i can see that as being very unrewarding for people and often why people do fall off diets very quickly they'll lose a few pounds and then they'll plateau and they're like ugh this isn't working anymore so screw this i'm just going to go back to eating whatever i want again but it's definitely that you need the behavioral changes. So it may be that, yeah, you start taking this drug, you feel sated, you start eating better. You're like, okay, so let's shake up the diet, working with a nutritionist and dietitian, getting those nutrients into you that are the brain healthy nutrients, getting your antioxidants in, you're know, eating healthy fats. And then you're seeing the weight loss and you're like, this is great. Like I'm feeling much better. And then when you stop taking the drug, because you've reached your goal weight or you're approaching your goal weight, then you can step out of using the Azempic or Wigovi and that you've already built those habits that will maintain your health for a much longer period of time because it's it's your brain. It's, it's not your body. Yeah. And I think you just nailed it there so much. And it's often what we see, you know, with the individuals we work with when they get off, you know, the sugar or the flour, the processed foods, and, you know, they definitely have the release of weight, but it is at like maybe a pound a week or, you know, nothing drastic like these GLP-1 drugs do. And so that I think sometimes if we're just motivated for food addiction recovery by weight loss, that's why people will go back to the food because it is as it's not as rewarding a life and you're not motivated by seeing that result in the body releasing weight. So I think you just really nailed it that without addressing the brain and the behavior change that, you know, a lot of people will have to be on these drugs for the rest of their life in order to have that maintenance. I'm curious, knowing what you have shared with us about high sugar diet, what do you eat in a day? What does a life, like a day in the life of Amy look like when it comes to like food and maybe lifestyle things that you do? So I really try with the sugar to keep a low sugar diet. And I also don't eat gluten as well. That's, that's a personal preference. That's just... I try to consume fairly low carb. I like to start the day with a coffee. I don't drink dairy milk. I have almond milk, which I've been consuming now for about a year. And I find that that's, that's much better for me as well. Again, I've been working out, you know, what, what's good for me. And as I've changed in terms of, you know, aging, it happens. And my body definitely has shifted in terms of its, you know, how it deals with calories as I've aged. But anyway, so I like to start the day with a coffee. I do a coffee with almond milk and I take my dogs for a walk as long as it's not raining because they are kind of averse to whether it is rained. They're not like water-based dogs. They're not into that side of things. 
but I like to take them out and then for breakfast I really like to have eggs like I make an omelette with say zucchini or mushrooms or I really like having like a chia seed pudding where it's you know it's breakfast but it's like almond milk chia a bit of oats some blueberries, some raspberries, you know, try and mix it up because otherwise I realize that I'm eating like way, just huge numbers of eggs. There's only so many eggs a woman could eat. And then because I'm quite sedentary all day, because I work from home a lot of the time, I do like to keep active as well. So I usually do a spin class or a yoga class, at least, you know, I like to do a spin class like three or four times a week and yoga a couple of times. Again, take the dogs out for longer walks when it's a a nice evening. In terms of lunch, again, I try to eat like a salad, maybe some like falafels, get some like high quality protein in along with a lot of greens for fiber. I think it's really good. And in the evening, at the moment, because it's summer, I'm very into like the salads and, you know, trying to keep things interesting with like amazing salads where, you know, you just have like all the colors. You're like, I've got some beetroot going on. I've got some, you know, mixed greens, some, you know, some peppers and tomatoes, cucumber, radishes. Like I like to try and integrate some fermented foods as well. I've been making sauerkraut, which is actually really easy to make. I'm not like the most technical of people, like I'm no, I'm no like chef, but I can hack up a cabbage and like somehow it magically turns into sauerkraut when I leave it on the side. Sometimes it explodes a bit, but you know, science and then it stops. And then you put it in the fridge and you're like, "Mm, I've got some like funky cabbage going on. And yeah, again, mixing in some sort of like high quality protein. I'd like you know, chicken potentially, or you know, having like chickpeas are really good. There's a lot of you know, like sweet potato type, like not meatballs, but you know, meat free, these kind of foods. Again, they're a high fiber. I try not to eat too much by way of red meat, although I do love a barbecue because you know it's summer and the cleanup is minimal. And I think that we all all need to have a, have a barbecue every now and again. I try to eat a lot of, you know, snack on nuts. Like walnuts are really good for your brain. They've got lots of omega-3s in them. They look like little brains. I think if anything looks like a brain, it's probably good for your brain. The other week, I basically got this like mushroom box thing and it made like a lion's mane mushroom, which me and my husband have been like absolutely fascinated with because you're like, oh my God, this thing just made this enormous mushroom. I tried cooking with that the other night. I'm no chef, but you know, it tasted like a mushroom, (laughs) which is like, I made mushroom nuggets and yeah, in the winter, I really like making things that, again, are you know, like a really good like veggie chili, I think is great. You can serve that with like quinoa and get some avocados. I eat loads of those just to eat as many vegetables and fruits as possible. And fruit obviously being high in fructose is one of the things that I think, you know, eat the whole fruit, like not make it into a smoothie or a juice and don't say that like your apple cider that you bought from the supermarket is you know a valid (laughs) fruit intake of the day because it's just sugar but definitely consuming you know like an apple or a banana i think you know just eat as many plants as possible get some seeds in there as well blueberries are awesome for you Try and steer away from grapes, particularly if they're in the form of wine. That's again, it's not a vegetable, it's not a fruit. (laughs) And also, I was reading about resveratrol, which is found in red wine, and people are like, oh, it's it's an anti-inflammatory, it's so good for your brain. I think you'd have to like consume, I think, about like five liters of wine to get like a physiologically relevant and dose of resveratrol, which has a lot of like really bad side effects of the fact that you're just consuming loads and loads of wine and it's alcohol and it's effectively damaging your brain tissue. So let's not do that. Just eat the whole things. And also I'm not much of a dessert person. So although I do like coffee, big fan of an almond flat white or a latte. Again, since switching away from dairy milk, 
I've had to like search for coffee shops that do unsweetened almond milk because I could put sugar in coffee if I wanted to. I don't like the option to be taken away from me and be given this like super sweet almond latte. But yeah, that's it in a nutshell. That's kind of I what. love it. You're I you're just so passionate about all these really good foods. And like this is what I wish I were to try to like sell to people that you know we're working with is that these foods are delicious and they are exciting and they we do love them and they do make us feel so good. And like uh, I can just see with your enthusiasm how much you actually enjoy the way that you eat. So yeah. I've been trying to coin the term. This is just because I, I was reading about like dopamine decor where people have like crazy bright eccentric houses and then dopamine dressing where you wear like amazing bright colorful clothes. I am like the person who wears black all the time. <laughs> She's wearing black right now. <laughs> black. It's easy. But now I want dopamine dinners and mm. I want dopamine dinners to have as many colors in as possible, not because they're like Skittles, because they're like- <laughs> I want fruit. I, I want vegetables of all different colors and, you know, just be a bit random and have like, throw some blueberries in your salad just because, mm. uh, you know, put in a beetroot because it's, you know, beautiful red color and then, you know, some edamame beans and some, you know, bright yellow chili or peppers and you know start to make your food look pretty and I love having food like that and you know my partner like he's he's not a chef or a cook or you know really anyone who makes more than a sandwich a lot of the time so you know if I get him to like eat this salad and he's like oh that looks pretty I'm like yes I've achieved something today It is. And then it's like when you have all those things in there, every single bite is a different flavor experience. And it's like the different textures. And yeah, it's exactly like people are like, oh, what are you eating there? And I'm like, back off. That's my salad. Like, unless you really want to, and I'll make you one too. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Why have you got a strawberry in your salad? Why not? (laughs) Exactly. You should definitely have that too. And pickles. I love pickles in my salad. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I've, I've worked on like lacto fermenting, all kinds of things. I'm just like, you can just make, you know, sauerkraut is kind of a pickle. I'm like, this is great. Um, it is. And you can get on like kimchi, which oh. is pretty exciting as well. If you have kimchi with an omelet or with Oh, egg, I put it on my eggs every day. It's we could definitely eat together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would be like, oh, why is this woman eating kimchi with eggs? I'm just like, Yes. <laughs> Oh, I love it so much. So where can our listeners find you and what are you working on next? So I have my nutrition consulting is through cognitionnutrition.ca. You can contact me there if you want to chat to me. I can also be found on Instagram, like nutrition. I should know my thing. I think it's called nutrition on your side. I'll definitely link it for you. So. <laughs> You can just request to be my friend and you're yeah. just going to be like posting pictures of food, being like dopamine dinner. Yes. And occasionally pictures of my dogs because I have no ability to be professional on any form of social media. And um, also, yeah, amyreichel.com is my, you know, it'll send you in directions of lots of papers and stuff, things that I've written as well. Yeah. So that's where I lurk around on the internet where you can find me, usually at home. Or, or walking my dogs. So there you go. <laughs> awesome. And we do have a signature question that I'm going to finish with. And it is, what would you tell a younger version of yourself about lifestyle, diet, maybe novel pharmacotherapies that can enhance brain health and mental well-being? I think that the thing that I wish I'd have known when I was younger, when I was younger, fat-free was considered to be good. and I was a, you know, a victim of that rhetoric that was spread by food advertising effectively. And that I just wish that I hadn't eaten so many candies and sweets and stuff and just thought it's fine because they're fat free. And I remember eating, you know, like marshmallows and being like, oh, 99% fat free. (laughs) It's it's all good, but you know, it's 99% sugar. And I wish that, you know, I could have at a younger age understood that, but it was definitely a different time. 
And we didn't know, well, all you know, people did know, but they chose not to tell us. And we were, you know, in a time where fat was demonized. And I wish I had eaten better when I was younger and, you know, potentially didn't shave off those IQ points. Could have taken over the world. <laughs> I feel like you already are. So I, I mean, it might be scary if you were smarter than you are. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today and sharing all your amazing knowledge with us. Oh, it's been great chatting. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, 